Um, I don't know if Mr. Huntsman or Ms. Bletz, I don't know how you guys want to break up your time, but whomever, how would you like to go? We don't give five minutes each? Sure. You could no, no, I'm joking. I'm joking. We, I'm, I'm going to talk and, and Katie is here to answer questions because she knows a lot more than I do. Okay. Um, Katie used to work with Judge Felton Henderson, who's one of the three judges involved in the Brown versus Plata um, order to reduce the prison population in California. And I think it's historically important to remember that all the reforms that we talk about with AB 109 and starting before that, they, we didn't come up with those and decide we wanted to do them on their own. They were done because federal judges told us that we had to stop mistreating people in prisons because we were providing substandard medical care for years and years and years. And when that decision came down, then Attorney General Jerry Brown appealed it, said it wasn't right. Ultimately, California was forced to depopulate its prisons a certain percentage as a result of those. And we then embraced it as a reform. So I don't, I don't fault any reforms. I just want people to remember that because it all stemmed from three strikes way back in the 90s when we then chose not to fund additional prison space. We jammed a large number of people into a small space in prisons. We provided them inadequate medical care. And the reason I'm pointing that out is the same thing happens at our jails. Um, the Inspector General's office in Los Angeles uh, monitors jail conditions. And we issued a report some months ago, which I provided a link to you on, regarding the intake process in county jail, which is so understaffed and so overcrowded, or was before COVID-19, that there were mentally ill prisoners chained to benches for over 24 hours at a time. They were given bathroom breaks and allowed to eat, but they were chained to a bench for over a day. And the concept that that could happen and that we could accept it and that nothing could come of it is, to my mind, damning to the system we have. And for that reason, I don't believe we should put people in jail who we don't have a darn good reason to put them in jail. Um, as you know from some of the members of this uh, commission having been personally involved, prison sent judge sentences in criminal cases range from probation to jail to prison. And as an afterthought, part of probation can be some programs. My advice to you, and it doesn't come from the Board of Supervisors or, or any official capacity, is to insert that programmatic level at the probationary level or independent of the probationary level so that we punish low level crimes without putting people into custody. Because when we put people into custody, we invariably spend too little money to take care of them. We take care of them poorly. And as a result, we are violating their constitutional rights. And we don't get the outcomes uh, we would like, as you heard from the, the statisticians who, who have researched the point. And I think it's gonna happen over and over again. I don't think we are capable of doing it differently. We have to put people in custody who are dangerous and violent, okay? But for those who aren't, we, can, we ought to be able to come up with other ways to make them regret committing crimes, make them want to change, and to help them change. And if, if our only option is putting them in the jail, we're gonna do a bad, uh, a bad job of it. That comes from my personal experience. I was a prosecutor for 23 years, so I'm not an advocate or an activist. Ms. Belts was part of the prison law office at one point, and, and as I say, worked in, in a different field and has a lot more direct knowledge and can answer questions uh, about the conditions in our jails in Los Angeles County, which I think are uh, indicative of, of what jails are like in general. They're not unique and also of the pr prison system, although it been, has been discussed, they're a little different. But the fundamental point is they're overcrowded. They were overcrowded before COVID-19. We, we released 5,000 out of 17,000 people in our jails. That brought us down to the, the state rating for maximum capacity, not for not during a pandemic. So we were greatly overcrowded before. We're now just overcrowded. And some something like 3,000 of the people in our jail system have tested positive for COVID-19. So we're generating uh, cases of COVID-19 as people come and go from our jails. So we're happy to answer any questions you have, but I just want to convey that if you can come up with a system that doesn't involve putting people in jail when you don't need to, you would be doing a great service for the people of the state of California. Thank you very much. All right. Um, I want to open questions up to the rest of the committee. Um, we have about half an hour to, to, to talk with you all. Um, and as was, goes with all of our witnesses, we hope that we can continue the conversation if things don't get answered. I want to kick things off real quickly with Ms. Cervelli. Um, one of the things I thought interesting from our previous panel, I don't know if you were able to listen to that, was their um, discussion of the way the jails work 
at least the jails that they studied, that there's pretrial jail. And Mr. King, it sounds like you spent a fair amount of time in pretrial custody versus custody in jail that was not pretrial, meaning that you're serving your time there. And that those portions of the jails or wings or even different facilities are actually better equipped. Is that at all resonate with your experience? Um, in San Luis Obispo County, that that was kind of how it goes. But I mean, a lot of people, I, it wasn't that kind of divide. There was, um, most people stayed like in the general population, which was just basically a shoebox with beds. Um, and then if you were there for a longer period of time, like you could go to the farm and work. Um, but I haven't had that experience of, I mean, there's holding, which is awful. And, you know, people cycle in and out of there. People just go in for a few hours and stuff. But um, I have not experienced that specific, like, difference. All right. Uh, Assemblymember Kamlager. Yes, thank you. Um, fascinating. And thank you to Bridget and James um, for um, your testimony. I think not only um, is the jail, are the jail and prison experiences sort of shrouded in secrecy, we've also created a culture where they're shrouded in shame. Mm -hmm. And we don't really want to have honest conversations about how we're treating people in the systems that we've set up to house folks. Because I think, quite frankly, we don't want to have to force the mirror on ourselves and acknowledge that that's something that we're allowing of our fellow brothers and sisters. So thank you for speaking to that. I actually had a question for each of you, and then I have a question for um, the larger group. The first question, Bridget, for you is I was wondering if you could maybe share if your, if your record actually proved an impediment once you were released to services and to employment, because we've heard a lot about that, but then we've also heard a lot of variances based on gender and race. Um, James, I wanted to know, especially after reading your, um, uh, your, the statement, for, for folks who are in prison, life without parole, for lifers, what does meaningful programming look like? I just have a very hard time wrapping my head around why we would keep someone in prison for life. And then I just, it's just very hard for me to, um, I just, it, I have a very hard time understanding that. I mean, I know obviously why we do programming, but it just seems antithetical. And then lastly, for, for the folks, I, I'm very curious about met, pre and post mental health assess, assessments. If you are sane, however we want to define that in the world of 2020, before you are arrested, incarcerated, put in jail or prison, I have to assume that by the time you get out, your mental health has deteriorated um, exponentially, probably, depending on how long you are there and where you're going. And so we don't really talk about that. I've had instances with clients and people that I know who went into prison and, or went to jail and they were kind of okay. And by the time they came out, it was like, oh my goodness. And folks who were not really high on the scale in terms of mental stability and then just deterior deteriorated much more rapidly. So can anyone sort of speak to what kind of true uh, measurable robust assessments are happening as it relates to mental health, kind of on a pre and a post scale, because we really need to be tracking that. And it just seems like we're not offering the kinds of programming that are important. And having someone go to some class to make them figure out how they need to tell everybody else that they're remorseful is not my idea of mental health supports. Um. Okay, I'll answer the part that you asked me about the impediments. Um, and it's interesting. Um, so for me, like I just, I got jobs at restaurants because um, they don't do background checks. And obviously that's going to be easier for me as a white woman, um, you know? And so that's what I did. Uh, you know, I had a, a life-changing experience when I was introduced to other formerly incarcerated people in higher ed. Because I have, you know, my mind is a, a huge impediment for me in my life. And, the, and then the increase in trauma that happened, um, you know, while I was 
throughout my incarceration and, um, you know, and the complete lack of protection and the complete message that, you know, you're insignificant and don't matter and all that stuff. Really, I deal with that still. Um, but um, when I, um, in, in higher education, I connected with a group of formerly incarcerated people. It was just like, four of us, but our faculty advisor was also formerly incarcerated and he's a lawyer. And so his whole um, like get down is, is helping people um, pa pass the moral fitness test so they can like sit for the bar. And essentially like what you have to do is you just have to get like all of this documentation that says like, I'm a valid person, I'm a good person, like, you know, um, and, and just, and, and also say, I. I'm wrong and I'm sorry for what I did and all of that stuff. And, um, you know, it's doing that with support is a lot easier. I cried the first time I went to an expungement um, thing because I, I put it off for a long time, but and it took hours. It's the most like ridiculous, difficult process to, to do anything to, um, you know, counteract your, your record that you get like that, you know? And it, it's, it's like re-traumatizing. Thank you. And thank you, Assembly Member, for that, that, that question. Um, I think that my first few years um, in California state prisons, there were people with, who had life without the possibility of parole sentences who had the most impact upon me. When you arrive at those facilities, it's typically just housing units and maybe a, a patch of dirt out front that's called the yard. There, um, especially at that time, there was no meaningful programming offered by the state or by the department that was attempting to engage that population. But what wound up happening was the people there create their own sense of purpose and their own sense of values in order to create meaning within their own life. When you're reconciling the fact that you will um, almost certainly never go home or leave that yard that you're on, you find ways to, a lot of people become devoutly religious. They, they tend to find ways to give back to the community. I knew a ton of people who took a lot of pride in um, the fact that the maximum security yards are, are places where people first start lengthy sentences. And so they would catch the youngsters who came onto the yard in order to kind of like give them the space to not give in to peer pressure, to not um, continue to perpetuate the same models of masculinity that we had learned growing up and just like gave them room to, gave us room to make different choices, hard earned choices. So a lot of it is people finding their own pathway, whether it be through religious programming or whether it be through education to give back to that community just to give people space to make better choices and, and to continue their own journeys of healing. Everything I think was often um, framed in terms of amends and giving back. Thank you. The mental health. Yeah, perhaps one of the other speakers could address the mental health. Yeah, Mr. Fisher. I'll, I'll try. It's hard. It's hard to follow up on those two really <laughs> eloquent, great statements, but I'll give it a shot. Um, screening in county jails is is uh, variable to say the least for mental health needs going in, and it's even worse once once you're in the system if you develop uh, uh, mental health systems or um, or a mental illness while you're in it. Um, it's very hard to then access services, get a full evaluation, and to move from there. One thing that I just want to mention, I've, been, I've worked in both the state prison system um, as an advocate and also in these county jails. One of the biggest differences for the mental health populations in those two systems is that in large part because some of the litigation that's happened at the state prisoner level, if you have serious mental illness, and there are processes for identification, there is every effort made to get you in to what's called the Enhanced Outpatient Program. 4,000 or so people in the state of California prison system are in those EOP, Enhanced Outpatient Program units, where they're supposed to get 10 hours per week of treatment every week, um, driven by clinicians. Doesn't always happen, but that's, that's the goal. 
when you go into county jails, nothing like that exists. It is very rare, if ever, that you'll find it. It's something that we work for in the jails that we do our work in. But what you actually see is something even much worse than just not providing treatment. I always start in the isolation units, the high security to solitary confinement units. And I say, can you give me a list of the criteria for who's gonna end up in this unit? And quite often in county jails, you'll see people who have high proclivities for violence, uh, leading gang members, these are criteria that they use, and mental health. So, not, so the, the criteria to get you into solitary confinement, which we know is psycho psychologically traumatizing um, for everybody, and particularly for people with mental illness, the criteria is mental health, if you have a mental health condition, because that's how, how jails manage that population, not through treatment, but through solitary confinement. So it, that, that has been a stark distinction that I've seen between the state prison system, which is far from perfect, and county jails. I might be able to also just... Oh. What? Go ahead. Pick up a bit from, from where Aaron just left off. Can you hear me? With respect to LA County specifically, thank you so much for having us and, and thank you everyone for your, for your testimony. It's, um, you know, uh, being really mindful and attentive to the underlying principles and goals of AB 109 and, and local confinement, which are obviously very important. I, I just feel it's really important to say that, you know, and LA County is a uniquely problematic, complex and difficult uh, environment for people who are confined in our jail system. And so with respect specifically to, to mental health, you know, we have on any given day 5,000 people with d diagnosed mental illnesses um, who, uh, you know, at least one or 200 of whom have very severe illnesses at the time that they're either arrested or, you know, shortly thereafter through the initial um, evaluation process sort of tend to decompensate if we haven't gotten them you know, back on their community medication regimen. A lot of them are obviously detoxing with, with co-occurring disorders. But so we have for those 100 or 200 people, and, and forgive the graphic nature of, of this description, but just, just so that I can illustrate it properly. I mean, we have people who are so ill and so symptomatic in their acuity that they are that they are inserting, they are ingesting, they are engaging in very serious um, self-harming behaviors, um, they, they smear feces. These are, these are people, human beings who, who are suffering tremendously. Um, and for those people, they all pretty much require licensed care, right? They require a licensed bed. They need to be in hospitals and they need to be stabilized on a, on a they need to get med compliant. Um, and we have about 32 beds for those people. So we're just in this process whereby we've got 100 or 200 people on our wait list for our forensic inpatient unit, 30 of whom at any given moment can be offered that type of care. So it's this process of constant cycling of, of human beings from just sheer isolation and utter suffering and highly symptomatic conditions that cause great injury and harm to themselves into a licensed setting where we're medicating them long enough to stabilize them. So we've stabilized their behavior. They no longer have to be in restraints um, and they finally become med compliant. But as we know, folks who are mentally ill, as soon as they're removed from licensed care, particularly Really, an environment like a county jail system that's so isolative and, and problematic in just a whole variety of ways that we can also go into in more detail, decompensate and stop taking their meds. And so then they just end up shortly thereafter right back on this FIP late list. And um, it's just utterly tragic. We, we do have a great one really good program that I could also talk about if someone's interested in, in terms of helping people transition. But I, we, I do want to hear about that. But you said there's 30 something beds out of how many beds in LA County Jail? Uh, we have a correctional treatment center that has, I think, a max occupancy of 100, uh, one, almost 200, 196, I think. But of those beds, there are, I think, 32, which are reserved specifically um, as part of the forensic inpatient unit, the mental health hospital. And what's the whole LA County Jail bed? Uh, we, well, pre-COVID, we had 17.5, and now we're down to vacillating between 12 and 12.5. We're talking about 17,500. Okay. I just wanted to make Total, sure. Total, and about 5,000 or so with diagnosed mental illnesses. 
And then there are a whole bunch of others who aren't diagnosed, who have behavior disorders and other, not those traditional axis one diagnoses, but who would clearly benefit from a lot more therapy and programming and et cetera, which we aren't able to offer them either. Uh, Senator Skinner. Thanks. Um, I, I really appreciate everything that's been shared so far. And James, um, thank you for once again, uh, just giving your, your insight and your personal experiences and being there. And uh, um, Bridget, thank you also. Um, and of course, our uh, researchers and such from the disability community. My question is more on why we're seeing this increase in uh, mental health, incidents of people with mental health challenges in our jails. And your slide that showed this huge jump since 2009. And what I'm uh, trying to figure out is, um, and whether you all have some research, I know one thing that's happened since then is we have lost board and care homes and SROs. And I don't know how, I mean, I know that it alone is not just that there's more mental illness in our communities, though that may be a factor too, but not by that jump. So what is it that we lost that contributed to this rise where in effect our jails and of course our prisons also are our mental health facilities? I'll try, thank you, Senator Skinner. Our office is doing a lot of work on this particular issue to try and figure it out. Um, the first thing that I thought was maybe we're, maybe we're getting better at identifying and doing evaluations. And my assessment through, mul through multiple investigations and litigations, honestly, is that that's not the case. That doesn't yeah, I don't think it could possibly explain that much, right. that increase. Yes. I, I, I and even if it right. was, that only means the problem is worse than we ever knew it was. So like, <laughs> that, that, yeah, that, I think that both, both are true. Um, I, I understand and I know that we're in your district, uh, in Alameda County in particular, there's a significant um, uh, gap in services and a lot of people point to board and cares in the community. Well, statewide, I, statewide, it, often board and care is significant. Yes, yeah, and I, just, I speak to Alameda County because we've been looking at that one specifically. Um, I, I think that is a piece. I think the, the, the bigger pieces here are probably one capacity for the, those uh, stronger mental health service programs that we know work. Yeah. Full service partnerships, permanent supportive housing are at the top of the list with peer supports with people with lived experience. There is There are two problems. One is lack of capacity, and then lack of linkages, effective linkages where people are being passed. I'll give one super quick anecdote. We were in a negotiations meeting with the county um, and said, we want to talk about their jail system. We said, we want to talk to the county behavioral health folks about discharge planning. And we all got in a room together and from the two agencies, the sheriff's department and behavioral health. And about halfway through, I just we just stopped talking because it was clear that they hadn't met that they hadn't just had a conversation about when someone is discharging from the jail, how do you do that warm handoff so the person has a place to go as soon as they get out and the person is set up with services, medication, continuity, those types of things. The conversation just didn't happen um, between two county agencies. So well, I that, know, those are some of the big issues that we've seen. I'm quite aware that obviously they're, you know, we need those kind of coordinated services, but I guess I'm, what I'm trying to get at is I don't want to deal with this as we need better treatment within incarcerated facilities for mental health people. No, I don't want people with mental illness to be in incarcerated facilities, period, zero. And I'm just really struck by that number. And I'm struck by the year that it started, the beginning of the recession. And the not beginning, it was actually the economy started going up by 2010. So where the numbers went up, 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 the economy was going up, 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 up. And of course, what did the economy do when it went up was put all these pressures, cost pressures on, uh, on facilities that were, have always been marginal, but at least existed. And I guess, um, well, of course, I optimally want 
really good supportive housing with services. I want anything other than a street tent and a jail for people with, so I, I, I'm trying to understand it better because just restoring board and care homes alone is so much cheaper than jail or prison. And uh, certainly does not address all of the needs, but it's gonna be a heck of a lot better. So that's why I'm, I would really like to understand it better because, um, you know, we may not, we're in another, we're in another economic downturn. We may not have the ability to provide the kind of optimal services, but if we can get folks out of, uh, into a situation where they don't have to act out on the street, which is what put them into the jail, then we're going to be better off. So. I think a lot of us share that opinion, Senator, and certainly um, Keeley said, you know, right off the top that the better that we invest in programming, uh, the, the, it's a financial savings, it's a very clear financial savings, so. Yeah, and of uh, course, this is a little different than programming. This is just pure, this is just getting property. It's the, uh, right. And decency and dignity and all of that. I mean, yeah. you know, um, I know that Dean Richardson has a question. Thank you. Um, so first, I just want to say how powerful this panel has, has been. Um, and I'm trying to formulate this into a question and not just make it a statement. So that's what I'm struggling with right now. And it follows up on the questions that have already been asked. So I, I think it's obvious that we need programming. We need programming at the county jails. We, we heard testimony um, about the horrific conditions there. We obviously need programming in the prisons. We have a duty to do that if we're sending people to these horrific places, warehousing people, treating them inhumanely. We obviously have a duty to do that. What I'm trying to figure out though is and this connects up to the financial conversation we had with the first panel and with Senator Skinner's question just now, which is we have the money to engage with our communities and with individuals and human beings before they ever have any contact with our criminal justice system. And this gets to what uh, Mr. Huntsman was saying, right? Like the, the, the issue is if we diverted all of those billions of dollars that we just heard about, not to warehouse people better, not to provide programming after they're there, not to provide mental health counseling, all of which is important, don't, don't get me wrong, it, critically important once we as a society have warehoused people in these inhumane places, of course we have to do that. What I'm trying to figure out though is what we on this particular uh, penal code uh, committee how can we help to divert that money away from the prison, not away, I don't know how to phrase this. We need that programming, but I want to figure out what we can do to avoid people being warehoused in the first place. And this gets to, again, Huntsman's question about why are we sending people there in the first place, right? And we know why we're sending people there. We have horrific criminal justice policies. We have police making arrests for ridiculous offenses that should not be criminalized. Um, and then we have prosecutors exercising discretion in problematic ways. We have, I don't have to go through the whole litany. Guess where, I guess where the question comes in is what can we do on this committee? So we have over-criminalization, that's a problem, right? Do we reduce the number of crimes in the penal code? Do we uh, deal with sentencing, which is one of the things we're considering, where we make uh, prison and jail not an option for particular crimes. Not that I'm saying probation is great, because we know all the problems with probation and supervision, right? So when you start thinking about the whole cycle, it feels hopeless. And yet there is so much money out there that we should be investing in our education system, in our mental health system, in our communities before anyone ends up in our county jails and prisons, which are inhumane. So 
I don't know if anyone has any ideas about what we can do on this, with our role on this particular committee to deal with the problems that you all so powerfully highlighted. So I guess that's the way I can frame what I just said into a question. Well, if, if, you, if I may, well, what I think, I mean, I, I don't have a magic solution because I think the bottom line is money. We don't have enough money. We're never going to have enough money. Uh, and that's because of the way in which democracy works. We always, always want to do government with the least amount of money. But I think the correct solution is, as you say, to put a ton of money into actual programs that take care of people outside of the criminal justice system, step one. But within the criminal justice system, I think you need to give judges tools and, and enumerated tools, not just probation, but rather specific programs that are designed to be the punishment and response to low level crimes. So that you, you don't wipe away serious punishments for serious crimes. But one of the biggest pushback you get from law and order types uh, these days, and, and I don't want to see this just cycle back and forth, is where well, you're just going to let people out. There's no consequence to, to committing crimes, and therefore our society is going to go to hell. And I think the response to that needs to be that we have to have a criminal justice system that is smart on crime, to, to coin a phrase, that actually categorizes crimes appropriately and has appropriate punishments. And those punishments include rehabilitation. And that needs to be funded. So I don't think it's an either or if you want to have a working system. I, I still strongly feel that as, as Katie pointed out, we've got 30 beds for 200 people. And it's, it's horrible that we're doing that. We, we should either, either in LA County release everybody over the 30 who we can't house appropriately, hopefully to appropriate facilities, or we should put in 200 beds. Um, but we in LA County recently decided not to spend billions of dollars on a new prison a uh, new jail in order to try to make it humane because I think we realized that we were chasing uh, uh, something that was was ne was always going to be just out of sight and we'd rather put that money into the programs you're talking about. So I think ultimately some way you've got to front load the funding at the state level and you've got to build that into our criminal justice system that we recognize even when we've got our grip on somebody and we want to punish them because they've done something bad that we are rational about how we how we do it. If we try to punish them too much, we're not going to get it right. We're going to hurt them. We're going to hurt ourselves, and and we're not going to accomplish the goal. So I think if you create a framework that that recognizes that and doesn't just leave it to judges and DAs and 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 defense attorneys to come up with a creative solution when they don't want to throw somebody in prison, actually give them a roadmap, uh, build it into the penal code for the low level crimes. Yeah, uh, for the for the the low low lo lowest ones. It shouldn't be possible to do things. We had a, a recent marijuana cigarette arrest where a person was hauled off to jail at a memorial site for, for somebody who'd been shot by the sheriff's department. And they went and arrested a, a girl there who had a marijuana cigarette, which we thought didn't happen anymore. And they took her into custody. Uh, they, they released her before she went off to downtown. But, but you, can, you, know, you can put a thumb on that scale. So I, I wouldn't give up that you can do something. I, I, would, I agree that it's not going to get us to paradise. Um, Ms. Cervelli has her hand up. Yeah, Ms. Cervelli. System, right. Um, so being, um, well, uh, to, to address like the first thing you were talking about, about how, um, you know, how, what are we, like the shift that has happened, like in not providing, um, you know, social services for people. Like for instance, when I um, wanted to get clean, I left San Francisco and, and I drove up and down the coast trying to get into a rehab anywhere. But if you don't have money, like um, there's been a, a serious shift so that all of our social services for like people without money or privilege um, have to like go through jail first. And then you get recommended by, or you know, you get placed in, in a rehab or, or whatever um, through jail and through a judge. Um, and to address, you know, um, what do we do besides incarceration? Um, I mean, I think that there needs to be a shift in, in our focus because the thing is, is like, um, I know very much like just from my experiences that, um, you know, as a victim of crime, I, <laughs> I strongly believe in restorative justice because incarceration um, is probably the reason that like, um, you know, the people in my life that hurt me did, um, or it contributed to it, I'm sure of it. And I'm sure that um, them going back, 
like makes it worse. And I'm also, I also know that like, there's no um, safety system for me there with a record. I mean, I got punched in the face, like in public one time and they drove me around until I like, well, I wouldn't tell them the name, but like, you know, they were driving me around to not take me to the hospital. And, and um, so there's no safety if, if you're, um, you know, if you have a criminal record or whatever, and there's no healing and that increases like the trauma. Like it's just, especially, I mean, in my experience with women in county jail, it's just like incarcerating trauma and then, um, and, and, you know, degrading your humanity and your self-worth and stuff. Because a lot of the experiences that we have like do that already, and then that kind of like further does that and you get no healing from someone going to jail and there's no accountability there. Like I, I have never like thought twice about the crime that I did because of my, my incarceration. So like it, when we can have that like human connection and have some healing and have people like face the things that they're doing and, and the hurt that they cause or whatever, I think that that would do a lot more to um, create safety in our communities because incarceration and, and policing doesn't create safety. Mr. King, I think you have, we have about, um, we have about three minutes left of this panel. So Mr. King. Yes, thank you. Um, I think that that's a great question. And for me, the, the like it starts with a, a clear understanding of the values and one value that I hold very closely is that the people who are tasked with enforcing our laws are not really equipped to um, rehabilitate people. Um, those are two different, very different skill sets. And I think we should, our sentencing and our legal system should reflect that. That we shouldn't be asking, like it, it's a misnomer or it's incoherent to have the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation because in many ways those are opposing goals and, and things that we're asking that department to accomplish, corrections and rehabilitation. Another strong value I think that should inform this committee is that punishment is not a pathway to safety. Um, people, we do not as a society become more safe because some people are punished for harmful behavior. Um, instead, what the science shows is, is that before any person ever commits harm, they received harm in their lives, did not have the tools to cope with that harm, and then acted out in harmful ways themselves. So what we need is a, a, a sentencing that reflects that these binaries we've created between responsible party or offender and victim are problematic. And we need sentencing or alternatives to sentencing that reflects the reality of what's really going on as opposed to the binaries and constructs we've created. So I, I think that holding true to those values and bringing forward policies that reflect those values um, is a start. Thank you so much. That is so helpful in terms of thinking about these important issues. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, I, I wanna say thank you to everybody on this committee. Um, I mean, excuse me, on this panel, the committee too. Um, there's so many different perspectives and we're learning so much. And again, from the beginning of what Keeley kicked us off, and then there's a whole ecosystem that begins with people's families and schools and mental health programs and social workers and foster care. And before we even get to prison, it's so difficult to um, untangle those find out where they're being counterproductive in so many different ways. And um, I think that that's you know, a big challenge for our committee and our state in general. Uh, your perspective certainly help. And as I've said to everybody, you know, we, no good deed goes unpunished. So we promise to be back in touch um, and want to, as we develop our ideas and proposals, bounce them back off of you guys to see where they make sense or not, because obviously the worst thing that we could do would be to make the situation worse. Or, um, we wanna, we wanna make, move in the right direction. I think most of us are on the same page, if not all of us. So thank you, thank you again. I wanna take another five minute break before the next uh, panel. I have 4.08, so let's come back at uh, 4.13 uh, prompt. And uh, thank you all again.
All right, let's get back to it. Um, let's wait for everybody to come back for our third and final panel. Thank you all. I know that we're running uh, a little bit behind schedule or a fair bit behind schedule. Um, just wait for a quorum of our group. people could turn on their videos. And I'm here. Oh, good, you're there. Okay, so I think that makes a quorum. Thank you, Dean, for reminding me. <laughs> uh, all right, so here's our, our, our third panel uh, for today. And again, I appreciate everybody's time, especially as we're running late. Um, and our final um, panel is about what it's like running jails and prisons, actually, um, especially, again, um, and we've somewhat artificially um, chop this in, in order to take bite-sized pieces of the the whole ecosystem that we're talking about today. We're primarily focusing on short sentences. Um, and um, anyhow, um, we have two uh, law enforcement folks here um, who uh, hopefully can give their perspective and, and shed light on everything that we've been talking about. I don't know if you've been able to listen to everything. Uh, but first we have uh, Butte County Sheriff Corey Honey who is the um, vice president of the Sheriff's Association. I think that that's correct. Um, and then uh, Charles Callahan, who's the deputy director for facility support for CDCR um, adult institutions. Um, Sheriff Honey, uh, we'd love to hear from you first. You're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, fantastic, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, so, uh, first off, thank you very much. Uh, as you said, my name is Corey Honey. I'm the sheriff of uh, Butte County. Uh, I'm also representing the California State Sheriff's Association on this call. Uh, I am the second vice president. I didn't want to uh, uh, leave that un, uh, uh, clear because I don't want to offend the first vice president. Oh, I'm sorry. I misread <laughs> That's that. That's okay. <laughs> no worries at all. Um, I'm going to keep my initial comments brief. You, uh, we, the State Sheriff's Association submitted um, a written statement, which I, which I know that you've all uh, read. Um, I will tell you that I have had an opportunity to listen to uh, all of the panels, and I found them to be very enlightening. Um, and um, uh, some of your community members uh, may uh, be surprised to know that I agree with a lot of the stuff that was uh, ultimately uh, said. And I think that uh, there's some real world context that we could provide for that. Unfortunately, we won't have enough time to do all of that. But um, in, in terms of uh, highlights or takeaways, um, uh, you know, I will tell you that um, running a jail, a local jail, uh, especially today, is a very, very difficult task. And post uh, realignment, uh, that became a much more difficult task. Um, I was here uh, when realignment came in as the undersheriff help develop programs in Butte County to deal with those impacts. And over the course of these years, um, I would say that my notion or understanding of what public safety is, has really matured. And I would begin with the um, statement that um, a, a strong and firm supporter in the belief that we have to address the underlying causes of criminal behavior uh, in a way that um, uh, allows people to move forward with their lives and become productive members of society uh, in, a, in a way that um, um, encourage them to not violate laws and, and find themselves to become involved in the criminal justice system. Um, and if we don't do that, we really haven't advanced public safety. If all we're doing is, uh, as some uh, commentators said, warehousing people and turning them back out uh, time and time again to re-victimize other members of the community, we really haven't done um, uh, a good job. I will say that um, for the most part, um, local jails just were not equipped to deal with the populations that we're dealing with now uh, post AB 109. In terms of the uh, level of sophistication of the, the offenders, uh, in some cases the, the violence that the offenders uh, perpetrate within the facilities, um, addressing the underlying cause of criminal behavior, uh, providing programs to reduce recidivism, um, to deal with people who have mental health issues. Our facilities really just aren't equipped to do that. And so um, I do see value in finding systems, one, that um, uh, early on in life, uh, 
uh, prevent people from becoming uh, involved with the criminal justice system in the first place. I think that's a, a very, very uh, important uh, part of this. Secondly, um, where uh, we, we need to have a better system to deal with people with mental health issues. Um, I think all of my counterparts would agree that uh, jails are not uh, the best places for people with mental health issues, um, but we have become the de facto frontline uh, centers for treatment of many, many people with mental health issues, and it's an unfortunate situation. Uh, and then last, um, I think one of the previous uh, com uh, commentators said that you know, incarceration is not always the answer, um, but the fact is sometimes, in some cases, it's part of the answer. But we have to be properly resourced. We have to have the proper facilities. We have to have the proper programs to, to uh, produce the best results. Uh, I can tell you that uh, I believe that we uh, at the local level can uh, provide better outcomes if we are properly resourced, um, if uh, we have facilities that meet the needs of the inmate population that we currently serve. And um, I would also tell you that um, I think the vast majority of my colleagues, especially those who came into office uh, post AB 109, would agree with these uh, statements. Um, we don't want to be set up for failure. And we certainly don't want to fall into the trap that uh, the CDCR fell into um, as we go forward. Uh, I would end with this. Uh, AB 109 was, was the product of a crisis at the state level. And the California State Sheriff's Association stepped up and certainly did our best to help implement uh, these policies, despite the fact that we were not well positioned in many cases to do so, and we weren't properly resourced in, 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 in many cases to do so. And I know that through there's been funding that comes through the CCP. Um, my experience, my own, person, my own personal experience in Butte County is that I've developed incredibly wonderful working relationships with my criminal justice partners, uh, and we have had some real successes. Uh, but I do know that there are other counties that maybe haven't experienced that same level of success. Um, all in all, we really do want to um, make this a better community. Uh, we want um, safe environments for people to live. Um, we're, we're not trying to uh, create uh, jail uh, environments that are uh, unconstitutional or that um, are inhumane or that are deplorable. Um, but in many cases, we're working with what we have available. And there's a lot of burden that has been put upon us that there's no other resource or system to deal with. And with that, my, my, sir, I will, um, I will conclude my remarks. Thank you. Like I, I started off this feeling that we, there's a lot of common ground here. And uh, we hope, if not today in general, to really develop specific proposals that we can all agree advance what we want, which is a more humane system that, advance, that also promotes public safety. So I look forward to continuing the conversation today and in the future. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Callahan. Good afternoon, Chair and uh, members. My name is Charles Callahan. I'm the Acting Deputy Director within uh, Division of Adult Institutions within California Department of Corrections. Uh, I started this position, uh, April, uh, I'm sorry, April 20th of this year, and prior to that, I retired as the warden of Chuck Walla Valley State Prison in uh, Riverside County. Uh, worked for 24 years uh, with the Department of Corrections, worked at five institutions, um, high security, um, medium security, and two female institutions. Um, I want to thank you guys for uh, allowing me to participate in this and I wish I would have had an attachment on here so I can read off the screen rather than a piece of paper but I'm just going to begin with a, a little bit of uh, statistics and go on into uh, my presentation and I'll, I'll be more than willing to answer any questions that you have regarding the material. Uh, for calendar years uh, 2017 and 18 the overall average length of sentence for individuals released from CDCR ranged between five and six years. While the overall average length of stay for offenders housed in state prisons at the same time of their release is approximately three years. The average length of stay does not include the amount of time individuals were housed in county jail prior to sentencing. Digging a little deeper, uh, over the last three years, uh, for individuals uh, admitted to state prison, approximately 37% of those uh, um, were coming to prison with uh, less than a year to do. 
um, regardless of the length of stay, when you get um, sentenced to CDCR, we're going to go through the classification process. Uh, the classification process will begin at the reception center. Uh, and of course, a part of that process will be evaluations uh, by medical, mental health, dental, and then uh, additional reviews will be uh, interviewing the inmate uh, and classifying them via score to make sure that we place the individual at the proper institution that best meets the security needs and uh, the individual needs. Um, the goal would be to uh, try to finish that reception center process as quickly as possible so that we can get the uh, individual to, uh, to an institution where they can begin their programming. Um, so uh, basically, uh, once the, once the uh, incarcerated individual gets to a, their destination, they'll begin with another uh, classification process that, that includes uh, conversations with a facility captain, a correctional counselor, a supervisor, correctional counselor uh, one, which is the actual uh, person presenting the case, and so it's an interactive process. So we, what we try to do is um, we, uh, we engage with the individual to find out you know, their, their individual needs. We take into consideration their uh, education level, uh, their vocational needs, their assessments, um, and, and, and their wants, uh, and try to come up with a program that best uh, meets that individual's needs. Uh, we also take into consideration the length of sentence as part of that decision when it comes to programming. Um, I must say that I, I think it's important, uh, this process, as a warden, that I did uh, lots of classification committees and it was probably one of the favorite parts of my job because I really felt that I, I was able to interact with the individual and ask them questions about their future and their education and, and what they're currently doing. Um, I, the, the important piece, I think, though, is that the classification process, it's not a one size fits all. You know, we do get individuals that come in, into the institutions that, you know, they might have a bachelor degree already and they don't really need that education piece. We get individuals that, that have a, a low uh, tape score education level, they, they really need that. We have inmates that come in with language barriers. We have inmates that come in with, so to say, uh, a job already set up for them in the community because they have a family business that they came out of. We. Uh, you know, we look at what didn't work uh, the prior time, if, it, if it's a second termer, um, what didn't work. And, and of course, you know, the whole substance abuse thing, we, we try to address all, all those type of needs and, and uh, we try to get that individual into a program that, that not only meets their needs, meets their wants, um, with really the goal of, of, of making that individual a, a better citizen when they parole and, uh, and a more productive member of society. So I have listed in here um, all kinds of programs that we offer the, at the institution. I know you're all well aware of some of these things, but you know, the, uh, some of these things, and I gotta admit, you know, I, I had never done Zoom or, or Skype before. Um, and you know, I, I retire in July and I come back in April and everything is different. So um, this is a, a, a kind of a little bit of a weird thing for me, but, um, Anyway, so, you know, we have all kinds of programs. You know, we have, uh, we have a very rich uh, vocational uh, career technical education programs where we, we have many, many trades. We have, uh, the latest thing has been the, um, the ISU DT program, which I'm not sure if you have questions on that, but it's Integrated Substance um, Use Disorder Treatment Program and that is broken down into two categories, which would be basically an outpatient and, and then an intensive. Uh, program. And then, uh, you know, we have some cognitive behavioral intervention. We have, we certainly have college programs that are available. Um, and uh, we certainly have uh, your full gamut of self-help programs, which I've personally been a part of I, as a warden. And I know all the wardens do the same thing. They attend these programs and it's, it's an amazing thing to watch where you have somebody that came in as a, as a gangster and gets in front of a group of people and they participate in a Toastmasters competition and you would never know that they were part of a gang uh, prior to, to coming to prison. So um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'll, cut I'll, you I'll, I'll, yeah. um, as we're short on time, I know that there's a lot of questions. Okay. I'm getting a lot of echo. So, okay, I think it's better. Um, I wanna answer, open it up to questions from the committee, but Mr. Callahan, I. You almost knocked me out of my chair. Did you say 
that 30 x 30 plus percent of people hit CDCR with less than one year to do? Out of that group. Out of which group? Out of the group that's serving, uh, the average group that's serving five to six years. And I must preface that, I'm not a statistician. I was provided some information. I, I, I tried to do is provide as much data as I possibly could. Um, but doing a deeper dive in the data I, I uh, stated before, um, over, over the last three years, for all individuals who are admitted to state prison, approximately 37% of those in, individuals coming to prison with a determinate sentence and did a projected uh, year of uh, projected one year elapsed. So that's not just the group. That sounds like it's everybody with a determinate sentence coming to CDCR has a year or less to do actually in CDCR because of credits and time that they may have served in the county jail. Is that what you're saying? Yes, and I'll confirm that data. That sounds... Yeah. That, that makes sense. sense. That makes sense to me, Mike, because it's people spend... It doesn't sec- make sense in terms of... Well, good, uh, good it's not quality. a good number, but it makes sense that people spend so much time pre-trial in the county jail, um, particularly if they have been declared incompetent to stand trial and have, got, have gone off to the state hospital for... 300 days and then come back and resolve their cases. By the time they get their their midterm sentence um, and go to CDCR, they don't have a, a lot of time left to do. Sure, and with credits. And, and I, was, Colin, I don't want to dominate this because this I have so many questions again. But is a year in CDCR a productive year, given all the uh, um, reception center and transferring and everything that you described? It seems like. By the time you've done all that, you're almost done with your year. Well, you know, honestly, I, I think that uh, it, there are times where it can be non-productive, especially if there's long wait lists uh, to get into key programs. But I think that that there's there's always something to do, and I I think that uh, you know, uh, is it time to get uh, an individual all the way through the AB one, two, and three and get their GED? If they're at the AB one level, no, it's a, that's not enough time to do. But can we get them into a vocational program to possibly get them some life skills. Um, I think that benefits them a lot, even if it teaches them how to go to work. We get up, we, we're responsible, we, we go to work on time. And, you know, you don't have to finish a vocational program to get a job in that program. You yeah. know, some of, these, some of these vocational programs, air conditioning, refrigeration, they take years to finish. But you can pick up major components of that and go out and get a job. Same sure. with welding, same with masonry, same with those things. And, um, and we do have some shorter term vocational programs, office services, uh, somebody can learn how to type, file, things like that. My, um, my, I appreciate that, but my the question I want to ask is, go ahead. given that there's not space for everyone in those programs, if you're in that short term, do you get to participate in that kind of vocational program? Many times you can, that's correct. I will say that some of the programs are more popular and at times some of the things that we balance would be is, um, you know, at the, at the lower level institution, so many more inmates qualify for, let's say a level two institution, more lifers are coming in. Now they're even housing uh, LWOPs. Um, some of those positions, they, they take up some of the, some of the spaces in, in some of those vocational programs, but we do our best to, to, to balance that um, because the last thing that we would want to do is somebody they can get through a program and then us not have space for it. Is and I think that's one of the things. Programming done uh, at the Sacramento or is that by the wardens? Who decides, who makes that policy? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the beginning of your question. The prioritization of who gets into which program and the program list, is that something that's done in Sacramento by statewide policy or is that done? At yes, the yes it is. So it's, the warden doesn't have any discretion really? No. Okay. Thank but you. what we can do is we have an inmate that is on a particular yard that really has an interest in a vocational program that's on another yard, we can transfer that inmate to another yard to get into that program. And, right. we, and we've done it many times. All right. I don't want to dominate. I'm sure there are lots of questions. Okay. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to keep going because I got lots of them. All um, right. Sheriff Honey, is that how you pronounce your name? Yes. Yeah. So um, I appreciate what you had said about AB 109 putting an incredible burden or a new 
burden and responsibility on sheriffs, you and 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 statewide. I was you said you listened to um, all the panelists previously. I was wondering. Uh, I was surprised and impressed that um, from the from the data from the first panelists that despite the lack of resources and the lack of um, design, program design, facility design that the jails have, that they seem to have better outcomes than the prison system for similar folks. Do you remember, you recall what? I do, I okay. do. Yeah. Uh, does that resonate with you? Can you have any sense of why you think that that might be true? And let me tell you that, you know, no good job goes unpunished, right? If you guys do better, maybe it's better to get keep more people in the jails that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be getting more resources but i'm saying that if you know you know where i'm going i, I do know where you're going i found that interesting as well um uh, i have seen uh some really incredibly positive outcomes uh through the programs that we have implemented post ab 109 and i certainly don't have time to go into all of that but um, uh, early on in our implementation of our program in Butte County, we partnered with California State University, Chico, and they studied our program. And we were seeing, and again, this data is dated, so I'd ask that you not rely on it now, and I haven't updated it. But, but at the beginning of the program, you know, we were seeing a um, reduction in recidivism of about 50% over what the population had been when they were, when they were uh, being supervised by CDCR. Um, and I'm not making any negative or disparaging comments about CDCR. Please don't take my comments that way at all. Um, but uh, I don't, my, my perception or thought is as to some of the reasons why that might be. I mean, certainly um, we are, uh, the realigned population uh, is uh, potentially more amenable to uh, programming and recidivism reduction efforts. So there's uh, the, the population aspect of that. Number two, um, I do see value in uh, programming uh, people and uh, for that matter to, to the degree that incarceration is uh, a necessary part of that process. Um, I do see value in, in doing it locally. Um, I see uh, when there is a connection uh, to the community uh, in terms of the individual who has been incarcerated, but as well as uh, the, uh, the people responsible for that um, I, I think it does result in better outcomes. And, and maybe, uh, you know, uh, if, if this individual is sentenced to my custody and um, we don't do anything to, again, address the underlying causes of criminal behavior, and then we turn them back loose into our community, they're going to victimize members of our community, including my friends and my family, or perhaps me, right? And so there is a stake. There's a, there, you know, we have a vested interest in, in that. Um, but again, um, I, would, I would hasten to add that um, even though the data, perhaps, because they couched it in very, uh, you know, lucid, perhaps shows that there can be better outcomes through local level. And again, I, 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 as I told you before, I, I have a strong collaboration with my community corrections partnership, my my probation department, my, the Public Defenders Consortium, the District Attorney, uh, Department of Employment and Social Services, Behavioral Health, all of those coming together, I think can provide really positive outcomes. But just because it's better, doesn't mean that there isn't room for improvement. And that's where I wanna make sure, yeah, I wanna make sure that I'm not uh, uh, sentencing my colleagues, as you said, no good deed goes unpunished, to having more responsibility, more pressure put on them because um, I'm, not com I'm not confident that the way in which our facilities are designed or how things are set up right now could accommodate more pressure without us really taking a look at um, uh, the facilities, the programs, and how we could improve upon that process. We, which is why we have the Department of Finance here kicking things off. Yeah. We realize that this is a financial issue as much as anything. Sure, sure. Other questions? All right, I'm gonna bounce the same question off to you, Mr. Callahan. Did you, were you able to see the prior uh, panelists, the first panel? I watched them all. Okay, were you surprised that folks that seem to have the same characteristics did better when they were better in terms of recidivism? There are many ways to measure better, but 
when they stayed at county jail versus when they went to uh, state prison? I, you know, I, um, <laughs> some of the presentations were hard, were kind of hard to watch and, and, you know, to hear your, your department uh, spoken about, like, especially when, when I'm so proud of what I do and I'm so proud of what my staff do that, uh, you know, but um, we can, we certainly take constructive criticism. I guess the comments uh, surprised me a little bit, but, um, you know, I, I, I'm that guy that always questions data and I, I like to do deeper dives and uh, when people, you know, make comments about data and, and results of, of research, but, you know, I, I'm not an expert in that. I, I just know that, uh, you know, uh, we do the best with what we have. And, and, uh, and I think, uh, like the sheriff said, there's always room for improvement. We need to take a look at the things that, that, uh, that we can do better. I mean, I was around in the prison system when we were really overcrowded and we did a bad job at everything. <laughs> so, um, I hope you don't feel that the, the committee is disparaging CDCR. Um, I personally, let me just say on the record, I'm personally friends with Kathy and Ralph. I know that they work extraordinarily hard, especially now. Um, I just am suggesting when we talk about short sentences, which is the today's conversation, is that CDCR is really designed to hold people for longer periods of time, mm -hmm. right? And that programming, rehabilitation, safety, security, all of those things, um, and that jails, um, despite their shortcomings too, and we heard about their shortcomings as well, have had, uh, it appears, again, with the various caveats, um, better outcomes, again, for these shorter term right. census. And, and I think that overlaid on top of that is the budget concerns, the state budget concerns, and the 37% of people hitting CDCR with less than a year to go that that was eye-opening. Um, I thought it was a, a, a very kind of a startling comment that I heard. Very, very interesting was uh, one of the members talked about maybe having yards that only had uh, inmates on them with short terms um, and design program, uh, programming on those yards specifically for those, those type of inmates. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, sometimes the, uh, our lowest level on our minimum yards, we have the least amount of programming. But it's what, but but on the other side of it, it's very calming to uh, the younger generation to have some inmates that are lifers or uh, inmates that have been through the higher security levels and work themselves down. I, I think they have a positive influence on on some of these youngsters too, and encourage in the program. And many times they're the mentors uh, to to some of these inmates that have shorter terms and stopping the cycle. So, and, I, and I also want to reiterate that. You know, people on this committee will know that, you know, my mantra is data, data, data. We, I want to further interrogate the data. Um, I, you know, if that is true that folks have good influence, let's figure that out. Let's find the data. Let's figure out how to maximize that. Um, I do think that CDCR is a great deal of data. The counties have a great deal of data that we may be able to find um, improvements, improvements here. Um, again, uh, I do want to open it up to questions. Well, I have a question. This is Song Richardson. Um, so first, I, I, I want to start out by saying I think that both of you um, who just testified, you, you are in a very difficult and sometimes untenable position. I mean, you, you don't have the resources that you need, as, as, as we've heard all day today, um, to do the things that you might want to do, including the programming that you want to do, the help that you want to give to the people who... Um, are housed in, in your facilities. I think we all recognize that, right? Because you, you're not the ones who bring everyone to your facility. People end up there and then, and there's too many people that you're responsible for and you don't have the resources to do the things you might want to do. So I, I, I want to make that part clear. I think, I think your jobs are very, very difficult because of that. Um, and then Sheriff, you, you mentioned that you have seen in your own uh, career, uh, people change as a result of the programming that they have. Um, and, and every time I hear that, it just makes me frustrated, right? Because if we could spend some of that, do some of the things we do in custody, while people are outside in their communities growing up, we would prevent some of the, criminal activity, et cetera, that, that we see, right? So 
I, I, I think your comment there was really important. So I, I guess the question I have for both of you is, until we're able to get the programming out in the communities, in our educational system, in our schools, et cetera, et cetera, do you think that we should be spending time reducing either through the criminal code um, or some other creative way, maybe uh, restorative justice or some, it, it, let me set that aside, how we do it. Do you think that there are too many nonviolent offenders in custody now? And maybe you don't have an opinion on that, or maybe you do. I'd be very curious because if we were able to reduce the population in prisons and jails, perhaps there's more capacity then and, and increase mental health services outside of prison and jails. Do you think that would help you in the short term while we try to deal with the longer term societal issues? Another way to phrase the question, maybe not to say nonviolent, do you have ideas of how we can reduce the population so that the populations you do serve are much smaller and that your resources go further? So um, I'll, I'll take a crack at that first, if that's okay. Um, and uh, also, uh, uh, reserve the right to reflect upon the question a little more and develop my answer as time goes on, if that's okay. Um, I'm going to take the kind of the first thing. You, uh, my initial comments, I, I hope you'll remember uh, me talking about uh, being supportive of programs uh, early in life uh, that uh, help uh, people develop uh, skill sets and, and uh, all of the things that they need to do to lead productive, happy, healthy lives and not violate the law or harm other people. Um, but you're right, um, when that doesn't happen, uh, they often fall in my lap and certainly in, in, in the lap of, of CDCR. Um, one of the things that we talked about is, um, uh, I, if, you, if, if you allow me to use the analogy, you know, deal with the low hanging fruit, so to speak. Um, I, I think addressing the mental health issue is something that would be very, very uh, uh, cost effective and um, something that we should look at because uh, if we can deal with that in a way that doesn't uh, result in uh, large numbers of people with mental health issues uh, finding their way in jail and, and there's another another person talked about the the whole um, restoration to competency process and how that languishes on and the difficulties that you know that creates um, I would love to see us focus in on building that system up and restoring it so that we could divert that population out of the criminal justice system, divert that population out of the jails. And then I think that we uh, would have a better opportunity to assess uh, what we need to do with offenders. Um, I think that, um, you know, certainly, obviously, uh, violent offenders are, are offenders that need to be dealt with, but uh, even offenders who um, are, are committing crimes that, you know, are, are harming people, uh, I think that uh, we need to address that. Um, and when I talk about uh, the incarceration piece, uh, and I haven't had a chance to really tell you about uh, a lot of our programs, but I think that's um, uh, a mix of actual incarceration coupled with programming while a person is in jail and then developing a pathway for them to move uh, to community supervision. And, and in my office, I have a a uh, program called the Alternative Custody Supervision Program, where we take offenders who've been sentenced under 1170H crimes uh, after doing risk assessments on them. Um, we move them out to the program. They're, they're supervised in the community. And that is where I have seen some incredible um, uh, stories of people uh, turning their lives around and finally, uh, you know, um, dealing with the trauma that they've had in their past. Um, uh, dealing with their addiction, uh, developing skill sets necessary to, to cope with, with all of that and to become productive members of society. And I can tell you on more than one occasion, I've had uh, individuals who've gone through that program uh, come up and, um, and shake my hand and uh, tell me that that was the best thing that ever happened to them because it got them uh, onto, the, onto the road where they, they have a, a much, much better life and, and uh, they found peace. So, um, that's kind of my stream of thought answer to that. I hope that helps you. Uh, but uh, that was that, that I think that's where I would I would go with that. Thank you. 
So uh, my thought is, is so th through my years of, uh, of, of working in uh, corrections, it's, I always find these batch of inmates and, and you know, it, it could be young or old or whatever. Um, I, I find these batches of inmates that, that you can tell just through conversation and watching them program that they're not coming back. And, and, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know if it's specifically a, uh, a group that commits a certain offense, whether it be, a, you know, a long time uh, crime of passion or, or whatever it might be, but you can tell that, you know, they get the, the incarcerated and they, they hate it so much they're just not coming back. And that, that group of people, I wish I could slice that group out and say, let's change some law so that group doesn't come back. I just don't know how to do that. Um, other than I think that we're just going to have a certain percentage that just aren't going to recidivate. They've learned their lesson. They're going to go back out and become a productive mem member. Um, I, and then the other piece of it is I heard somebody earlier talk, speak about um, the, the success of, of, of people that do time in, in jail near their, near their homes or their counties where they're from, that they're, they're more successful. And, and, you know, for me, what I've seen is, is sometimes the problem is at home. And, and, you know, they do their time and going back home where they're a third generation gang member or they're, they live in a community that is just infested with drugs um, or, um, you know, maybe that's not the right place to send them. And uh, right back into the problem that, that kind of uh, led them uh, astray. So um, I don't know, that's, that's my input. I got to interject here a couple of things. First of all, uh, that, that's certainly true, but we need to look at the data. It's also true that uh, Department of Parole Operations requires people to go back to those very yep. communities. So that's, you know, on CDCR too. County of um, Commitment. Right. I, I guess um, I had a question though. We talk about programming in this sort of very generalized term and that everybody says more programming, more program, more programming. Um, Maybe even Senator Skinner or Assembly Kamlager has more information on this, but I recall from last year there was a state auditor's report from CDCR programs that showed little, if any, impact. Um, I don't know, Mr. Callahan, if you know what I'm referring to, or can I you do. address that? If I remember it correctly, there was, it showed that we had a bunch of programs established where there was uh, little participation. If I, it might have been right before I retired, so I I might not have read the whole thing, but um, I, I, I do remember that. And um, I think that there were some, um, I'm not, I can't speak to other institutions, I can speak to my own, but um, there were uh, some situations where programs were started up, however, nobody was hired to run them. Uh, so the position showed as being vacant. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, overall, I think, I believe in our program. I think it's excellent. I've seen these programs in action and I've, I've seen, uh, in some cases, what's available or not available in the communities. Since I'm the father of four sons, I, you know, I, we all have the same needs. And uh, I look at these schools that are out there for, for uh, kids that want to go to vocational programs, and they're hard to find. Um, so I, I, you know, I, our, uh, I can tell you that we try to learn from uh, self-help programs. You know, those AA and NA, they're lifetime programs. So you get 25, 30 inmates into an AA program, it's full and other people can't get into them. So we had to think, oh, how do we establish like a 12 week AA program where um, participants can cycle through. So we design them a little bit differently. We also have them in Spanish. We do uh, Narcotics Anonymous. We do all those things. But again, one size doesn't fit all. So maybe we need to do them at, you know, after, after chow in the evening. And we also have a, a slot at three o'clock in the afternoon. We can create a new group. So it's, uh, you know, like I said, we're always trying to get better. Uh, but I, I, everybody gets it that, that these are the programs that they need. And uh, so, so, Sheriff, you mentioned that there was a study about um, outcomes in your jail. I don't know if they identified specific programs and also CDCR. I'm pointing to different to the opposite sides of the screen because that's just where you are on my screen. But uh, so um, the CDCR track the outcomes of specific programs. Do we know which programs work and which programs don't? CDCR. Yep. What? It, it, so, are you, what do you mean by success? Like lack of lack of. Let's just say lack of recidivism. Okay. No, I I don't have the statistics on that. I really don't. Do we know CDCR tracks it at all? Or no. We, 
I think we uh, I think we tracked darn near everything, and okay. uh, so that would probably be a good we'd question get, for. Uh, we'd love to get that throwing money at programming's writ large, obviously. Mm -hmm. And sheriff, right. was that study that you mentioned was that directed at specific programmings, or can you just unpack that a little bit? We'd love to see that study too. Yeah. Uh, again, so the study is dated. I want to make sure that we all okay, good. Um, and so it looked at our alternative custody supervision program. And when I uh, what I'm talking about that is it's a program where uh, people who were sentenced to a county prison term under 1170H, um, and it wasn't a split sentence um, uh, because early on Butte County wasn't doing a lot of split sentences, and so we developed a program that allowed us to take people out of the jail, put them on a community supervision program. Um, most of them were monitored with the GPS ankle bracelet. Uh, they, uh, they were required to either live in uh, sober living environments or stable homes, uh, because if, you're, if you don't have a home, your chances are, of success are low, pretty low. Um, we uh, set up a day reporting center. Uh, within our day reporting center, we offered a whole host of evidence-based uh, programs designed to re re reduce recidivism. Uh, more recognition therapy, which is a cognitive behavioral change based uh, uh, program designed to teach people to evaluate their decision making process and, and make better decisions ultimately was the foundational element that but beyond that, depending on the individual, it could have included, you know, uh, a GED or life skills or uh, uh, NAAA, whatever, uh, whatever uh, particular issue that we thought based on their um, uh, screening. Uh, would be appropriate for their program. Uh, we also um, uh, brought in uh, vocational training, uh, obviously somewhat limited in terms of our capacity, uh, and that uh, has resulted in some incredible uh, uh, work uh, being done. Uh, we have uh, uh, work crews that work out of our day reporting center, out of our alternative custody supervision. They go throughout our community um, uh, helping with uh, community projects, cleaning parks, uh, doing all kinds of things, and, and, and it's very interesting how well they're received uh, by members of our community when they're out. Um, and, you know, you, there was that earlier talking about this stigma associated with being incarcerated. I've actually seen where, uh, you know, uh, we, had, we had a program where they would go out and, and clear brush around the homes of elderly or disabled people for fire fuel reduction work and when they couldn't afford to do it themselves. And you'd have these people baking cookies and, and bringing them out to, to the crews because they recognized that they were out there uh, really doing something important. And the, the, that interaction was, has been really amazing uh, in terms of um, showing these individuals that being productive members of the community, helping other people has its own reward, its own value. Uh, and you make that connection. It breaks down barriers on, on both sides. And I apologize for kind of rambling on. I actually really am proud of the program. Um, it's a it, it is good and I'm not doing it justice. So I, I I'll stop there and is it ongoing yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is it maxed out so uh, um, It is not maxed out. Unfortunately uh, COVID has put, put, put COVID uh, Yeah, aside. yeah, uh, yeah, so a lot of a lot of our uh, prior to COVID. Lot, yeah, oh prior to COVID. No, no prior to COVID. We we're going strong uh, You know, we could at we averaged about a hundred uh, uh, inmates or participants, we call them participants, uh, in the program. Um, we could have capacity for more, but again, COVID's kind of put a damper on things. Let, let's put a COVID aside. And you said a 50% reduction in recidivism for that group? Yeah, but please, I don't want to overstate my, the value of that. You, yeah. We're going yeah. to double check your math. I'm just curious about Okay, okay. But, but yeah, and it, it was, it was, sounds like. it was, yeah, it was, it was, uh, and again, um, and we don't, con we haven't continued to update the study because internally, uh, I don't have the resources internally to gather data, evaluate the data, write the reports. That's why we partnered with California State University at Chico. Got it. And do you think that this is something that's like Butte County, we're very able to do this because of the particularities of Butte County or is general, this is something that could be transported to other counties? No, I think other counties, and as a matter of fact, other counties uh, would come, they came and looked at our program and they adopted various aspects of it. Uh, I know I, I do think, I, I think it's very doable. Um, we've developed a great working relationship with uh, probation. So now when we have a split sentence, uh, there may be a period of time where the person serves uh, uh, time in jail. I, ideally, that we would be able to program in the jail. That's where I'm falling down. I don't have enough 
space in the jail to provide adequate programming while they're inside. But once we're able to move them into our uh, alternative custody supervision program, uh, after they're done with the incarceration or the, 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 the jail side of the split sentence, we do a warm handoff to probation and they can continue uh, on a whole host of programs uh, there. I mean, my goal, and in, in, in many cases we've, we've been successful, by the time they're done with a uh, custody supervision program, uh, they're living on their own. Uh, they've got a place to live. It's a stable place. Uh, they're clean. They're sober. They've got a job. Uh, and they uh, you know, are, are living a productive life. And we find that when we can, we, we can get that in place, uh, most, a, a good majority of the time, we're not seeing them reoffend. We're, we're not perfect though, please don't. I, we have our, you know, we, we fall down too, so. Of course, of course, we're just looking for what's better than what's correct. Yeah, yeah. Mike, I don't I, want I, over, yeah. oh, I'm sorry. sorry. I, I was just gonna ask quickly, uh, Mr. Callahan, having heard that, does CDCR have anything like that? Or do you think you all could have sort of a, a day reporting thing? I know it's a little bit, outside of the usual CDCR um, situation, perhaps. I'd just love to hear your reaction. We have, to we have alternate custody programs. We also have been, um, the community reentry programs where they, they finish their time out in the community and uh, the ACP, the, uh, uh, they finish their sentence uh, either in approved home or, or at their residence. So, yeah, so we, I, we have I, those I, programs I, also. So you're talking about the MCRP program? Yes. Yeah, so and, that's- And the ACP. Okay, ACP, I've never heard, what, what's that? It's where they finish their time at either at home or a different residence where they can start working. And, you know, sure. they have rules where they have to be home at night and, and things like that, but. The, the men's community reentry program, from what I understand is, is great. It is, you live in a, in a uh, sort of halfway house situation, but in the, right. in the community. My understanding is it's about 1500 people though, correct, statewide? I don't, I don't have specifically the numbers, but we have them in various counties, I believe. Butte okay. County is one of them. We do. We do have one, yeah. And that's uh, overseen by probation uh, in collaboration with CDCR, and it's turned out to be a good program. We got a uh, couple in LA, San Diego. It's small. Yeah, yeah we, the numbers are in the memo. Um, and obviously, I think COVID has, has changed them. Uh, right now, it looks like there's 48 people in ACP, about 400 in MCRP, and 250 in CCTRP. And we had the numbers from January as well, and they were higher before the and we're situation. And now we're starting to release inmates back out to those programs. Um, those programs those programs seem great. And do we, know, do we have uh, recidivism data on those programs? I'm sure there is. A, we, can, we can get that for you. I don't and, have it with me. And this was, goes to both of you, to Sheriff. Do people escape? Do they run away? Do we, are you, I mean, or do they yes. commit crimes? How, how dangerous is this? So I, I'll, I'll jump in. Yeah, the, the fact of the matter is there are people who uh, we put out and um, they're doing well in the program and they fall down. Uh, and so there's a couple of things. I mean, you know, certainly addiction is a very, very difficult thing to deal with. And, and we will have, have people who will, uh, who will fall down, they'll use. Um, oftentimes we'll use a flash incarceration to deal with that and then uh, you know give them an opportunity to come back out we also have people who will cut their ankle monitor they'll cut the strap and they'll run um, sometimes I'm amazed at uh, the fact that they'll do it with such very very close to the end of their their time they'll they'll cut a strap and they'll run it it's always I wonder about that that actually is a state prison uh, eligible uh, felony that's one of the 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 things that we tell them you have an opportunity don't you know uh, try to take advantage of it uh, and we have had people who have gone out and and committed other very serious crimes or, or violent crimes but again um as i said we're not perfect um but we do have uh we do see some success and ultimately we had to, we had to put this program into place to deal with the impacts of people on it because simply there was was not enough room in our jail to house everybody and um we operated under a court order population cap uh, and we just couldn't get in a position that we were going to exceed that which is why we we were put into position to develop that program sorry it seems like though for the best um i'm glad we have the program yeah we've got 10 minutes left on this panel do other folks have questions oh well maybe um yeah. It's just so much going on in my head because um, I I just think there's like something fundamentally wrong with um, 
an expectation that formative growth for so many people, mostly men, over a very long period of time, you know, happens in a prison, happens in a jail, happens in a facility where they are, that is not where people, you know, ideally should be learning and growing and growing into who they are going to be as an adult. And maybe I'm saying that because as I'm listening to you all talk, I'm thinking about so many people that I know who ended up in prison at, you know, 18 until they were, you know, 35, because that's where their parent was. And it's like, you know, when we're talking about shorter sentences and when we're talking about recommendations that we can take, part of it's about breaking that cycle, which just, it should not be something that is in existence and so embedded into so many communities. So that's going on in my mind. And then listening to what you all were talking about, I just, there's a part of me that's saying, okay, what kind of programming is out there that's working? What should we be doing more of? You know, how do we support those and fund those programs to make them more robust? Then there's a part of me that thinks about all of the things that I hear in public safety. And oftentimes the battle is programming versus staffing. And the concern is if we're lessening our populations and somehow that means we'll be decreasing staffing. And then there's this kind of fight about that. Um, and how does that get addressed? Because no one seems to want to have conversations about how you retrain or reimagine the staffing that you have and actually what the staff folks are actually going through in these facilities. And then the other thing that sort of has me thinking is culture change because <clears throat> you know, inherent in all of this is if we're thinking about how to create better systems and making our facilities more productive, successful, humane, healthy, et cetera, we really have to have a conversation about the purpose of them and then the culture that is within them and how do those things get addressed in a, in a way that is honest so that all of us on the committee and the presenters can be better at what we're supposed to be doing, which is to make all of this better in the end. It's not a question, or maybe it is, but it's very muddy. And I don't know if there's a response. Um, and I applaud you all for just kind of sticking in and doing the work that you've been doing, because it really probably in most days feels very, um, um, you know, without any kind of gratitude. But I do think we have to address some of those. I mean, I'm thinking about the, my, my county, LA, there's, it's a hot mess on a number of levels with regards to numbers, success, the interaction between um, the jails and probation. I mean, it's just like, where do you start? That's not for anyone here to answer. I'll wait to ask that of sheriff, you know, my own people, but, you know, culture change, staffing versus programming, you know, and ultimately, you know, how to look at shorter sentences and are people afraid that shorter sentences means like less people staffed? I could address a little bit of the staffing uh, question you're talking about. So staffing is an issue in particular, some institutions that are possibly in outlying areas. Um, you know, we've thought about different and creative ways to, to do recruiting. The, the one comment you made that I thought was interesting. So one of the institutions I worked at was a higher level uh, institution. And um, it was a father son or cellmates. And you talk about generational and, 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 and things like that. I just thought, man, this, this, these two are probably spending more time together now than they did growing up. And um, you know, so I, I think that's interesting. And I think that's just a small example of what happens. And then the other part, I know we, we all want to measure success. And uh, I, I know at the institutions that I've been at, I've been to graduations and all of them, the high school, the GED, the vocational cert. And, and you know, I measure success sometimes by seeing how proud these individuals are of their accomplishment, something probably that they've never accomplished in their life. And they're walking down that, that, that corridor receiving their their associate degree and how proud I am of them and how proud they are themselves. And then they turn around their family members in the audience, their mother, their uncle, whoever that might be. And 
you know, that's to me, that's success. And, you know, I, I, I don't have the data on how that translates to success in the community, but I know one thing, if nothing else, it improves self-esteem. And when they do parole, they're going to keep that with them. And, um, you know, so I, I just thought I'd put that out there. I think that's incredibly important. If there, if there are no other questions, I, I just wanted to make an observation that I think that I don't know, I don't know how to answer it. I don't know if it's beyond this committee, but again, it's beginning with uh, Keeley's uh, opening mar remarks. It, it, the more the people you talk to, the more it feels like you know you're holding on to one part of the elephant and trying to solve your particular problem when it's really this giant ecosystem that needs um, to work better together. Um, and um, I guess in closing, um, are there, and, and again, this doesn't need to be today, uh, we hope to be able to circle back to you, are there specific ways that you guys um, think that the penal code can work more efficiently to get the better outcomes that we want, um, which is um, increased public safety um, and reduced reliance on unnecessary incarceration between police, probation, CDCR, sheriffs. Are there? So, um, I, let me let me uh, say this, and and, I, and I'm going to say this is my opinion. I'm, I'm not. It's not representing that of the California State Sheriff's Association. It's my opinion, and um, I don't even know if I can fully formulate the opinion uh, and articulate to you. But um, a, as you know, if you sat down with the California Penal Code, it is voluminous. It is confusing, um, and we tend to. Uh, run to the legislature and pass all kinds of laws to deal with all kinds of uh, situations and problems and concerns. And then we put it upon law enforcement to address those when perhaps um, that's not the best mechanism. And uh, I see uh, law enforcement uh, being used uh, more and more frequently over the course of you know, my career to um, address problems and situations that really should be perhaps better addressed uh, uh, in the family or through, you know, uh, appropriate education or through community, um, you know, programs. Um, and so I, I'm not, I don't know that I'm, I'm articulating that as well as I'd like to, but I do think that um, there has been an over-reliance upon law enforcement to solve all of the ills um, that society is facing and that people don't want to deal with or be confronted with. And so they turn to law enforcement to address that. I have to tell you that I agree wholeheartedly. And that's a collective conversation that we all have to have because whenever there's a problem, everyone says, let's call 911. And our response to anything we don't like, regardless of if it is criminal or illegal, is to call the police because we're interested in punishment. And that's something that requires all of us to really acknowledge and think about. But it's also about the anecdote, because I have to tell you, there are so many folks who get a call from an association or a group who says, let's do this bill, and it's based on anecdote and not data. And then they come up to Sacramento with this idea that is rooted in emotion in an effort to get something passed that has unintended consequences that we all have to face. And so that's also a responsibility that all of us have to say no to that because we cannot be forced to pass policy based on anecdote and fear. I would love to sit down and have coffee with you because we could go on and on forever about, about, about Call that. me. Call yeah. me. <laughs> I agree yeah, with all of that. I just wanted to add that I was struck by, um, Sheriff, your comment about the mental health. And, uh, and of course, um, Mr. Callahan, you talked about the um, 
AA programs, Narcotics Anonymous and such like that. And I, you know, we, we get some numbers as to how many people in our system are, uh, have mental health issues. We also get some numbers and I don't even know how accurate they are where it's addiction is the primary thing. Now, certainly if, if, it's an underlying addiction, but there's some serious, serious uh, violent crime or sex crime. I mean, uh, you know, obviously there's um, a great uh, rationale and logic for them to be in prison or incarcerated. But Absolutely. around, around uh, we know that there can be what we might consider petty crimes that are a result of an addiction that mm -hmm. would, once you've done to, you know, you've got a certain number of them, then obviously you end up, you know, in uh, state prison or, and, you know, it just strikes me continuously that really our, as good as our addiction programs may be in, or even our mental health treatment in our jail and our prisons, that really is not their purpose. Their purpose is not to, uh, you know, to be the place to solve someone's addiction or to resolve their mental health issue. And I, um, uh, you know, when Ms. Kamlager Dev said, you know, people that call 911, I, I think, yes, some of them from the punishment point of view, but some of them just because they see that problem outside of their house. They see either that addicted person or a person acting out from a mental health point of view. And then, of course, you call law enforcement, law enforcement, they have, I mean, it's, I can't blame law enforcement. And, uh, and then if we've got some new code section, brand new law that, you know, just happens to be that person, whatever there was they were doing fits into it. So I feel like the addiction and the mental health is really something we have to take seriously because it would, I think, greatly, it would relieve, it's not a fair, I mean, our correctional officers are not trained for either of those things. It's not fair for our correctional system. And it certainly doesn't necessarily resolve it. So I think, you know, it, we're supposed to be looking at the penal code, but I feel like sometimes we have to think outside the box and maybe one of our best uh, recommendations will be to seriously try to parse that out. On top of well, the Kevin Reese. Say that um, again. I said on top of the catch and release issues. Yeah. So, uh, Senator, I, I want you to join us for coffee as well, because uh, I, I think uh, um, there's so much that you said there. And uh, what we find in law enforcement is, um, especially um, at the local level, we are the 24 hour per day, seven day per week uh, portion of the government that you can reach to solve whatever problem you're dealing with or whatever concern you have. And so that's why a lot of those 911 calls happen because, you know, at two o'clock in the morning, uh, in most uh, counties, you can't call behavioral health. Uh, there's nobody to answer that phone. And so we end up in those, in those situations. You're absolutely right. Someone then decides, okay, we're going to pass a law that gives, um, you know, that, that, that deals with this particular concern or issue. And now we're put in a position where, you know, we roll out there and, and oftentimes nobody's happy with anything that we're able to do. Um, uh, because uh, it's just not the right fit for, uh, for uh, the skill set that we have. I'll add this, though. And I, I do think that we have, we have made a, a lot of strides in both the corrections and, and, and law enforcement to train our people to deal with people with mental health issues, to, to de-escalate people. But as we've talked about, um, uh, you're trying to uh, address a problem with a group of people um, and there isn't the infrastructure to deal with it effectively on a long-term basis. And I think that's kind of what we're talking about. I'd just like to add that it, uh, it reminds me of uh, the pathway uh, to incarceration of a female inmate. It happens all over the place where their path pathways are a little bit different. And we talk about crimes that send individuals to prison. Well, what was, what happened before that? I mean, it could be the mental health. There could be the substance abuse. It could be that led to the armed robbery the, to support the drug habit. Uh, or it could be the behavior due to mental illness that led you to crime that send them to prison. And um, so I, I think it's important to look at those, those, those things. All right, I'm, I'm gonna keep us on schedule here and, and close this out. I do wanna say thank you to you both so much. 
I sincerely believe there's more common ground in this area than people uh, assume. Sometimes we get uh, captured by our own piece of the elephant that we're holding on to, um, and that we all really want um, what's best. And I, I think that we can achieve a lot of the goals at the same time and not saying that there won't be disagreements along the way. Yeah. Um, so like I said, we, we will be in touch, but also I implore you guys both, when there comes a situation that says, ah, I wish I could do X, but I'm prevented by a particular statute, call me, call, call. <laughs> That's what our purpose is. We'll be the 24 hour hotline for you guys on that. I will be at least because sometimes it's a big thing like realignment and sometimes it's a little thing like did you know that this comma in this statute messes everything up and how much more I could do if it said and instead of or or whatever it happens to be please please let us know um, Sometimes it's a regional thing or a district thing or an individual thing and it doesn't require a law that will change everything across the state. It's like regulation or it's a conversation. Yeah. So we really want to try to, you know, there's obviously legislative committees that are, 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 pro, are um, designated to, to deal with this. They have so much more on their plate and all lawmakers are dealing with all sorts of problems, especially in this incredibly busy time. This committee is set up as a permanent committee to address uh, criminal justice and penal code issues. Please, 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 um, you know, use us as a resource to the extent we can. We're certainly going to use you as a resource. So, um, you know, thank you very much. To everybody else on the committee, I'm going to move right into public comment to try to keep us on um, track. Um, we are also, as a reminder, meeting tomorrow morning to, as a continuation of this um uh, committee hearing to discuss the business and on our old business but thank you again to our panelists um and i do want to move things on to uh the public comment and i have instructions on how to do that so thank you again Sharon. thank you, thank you. Um, all right we are now at, we are now into the public comment uh portion of our uh program um to get line and comment please use the raise hand uh function in uh in zoom if you are calling in you can hit pa uh, excuse me star nine uh please note that this meeting is being recorded and that if you make a public comment your name or phone number may be displayed in part of that recording um, so if you'd like to uh make a comment please select raise your hand or dial star nine on your phone we'll take a minute now to see how many people want to comment and based on that we'll we'll portion out the time Gone so long that I don't see any public comment. Hands question. Answer is, oh, I see one. Clifford, let me cure up for us. Okay. Is it, Ms. Clifford, are you still there? She's coming. She had a, she has to come in as a panelist for technical issues, but here we go. Okay. Oh, you're muted. I'll unmute you. Am I unmuted? Yes, yeah, you're good to go. Okay, I, I guess the only thing I wanted to ask is, um, I frequently have heard from other sheriffs about the 109 clients changing the complexion of the jails because of the criminal sophistication and violence that it contributes to the jail population. And I'm confused by that comment every time I hear it because I thought the 109 clients were low level nonviolent offenders. So um, I'm just curious where that comes from. I've heard it in, you know, several sheriffs mentioned that. Um, and the other thing that concerns me when you, when you talk about closing facilities is that um, economically there are entire towns that are built around, around prisons. And how is the state, and I, this doesn't have anything to do with the penal code, going to address the economic needs of those regions um, and assure people that they've got some support when those things happen. That's it. I think those are both good questions and comments. Uh, with regard to the realignment issue, I mean, I'm not an expert on this, but I think the idea is that prior to realignment, uh, the vast majority of people who were housed in county jail who were serving their sentence at least were for misdemeanors only. 
Um, they did house people pre-trial, who's very serious felonies, but the people that they were housing were for their sentences were misdemeanors. And now with the, with the AB 109 realigned population, you're right, they're non-serious and non-violent offenses, but they are felonies, so they are you know, more serious um, in general. There are much more of them. I think that that's undeniable. The volume is increased with the except, you know, putting the COVID situation um, aside. Thank you. Um, are there other questions? All right. I'm not going to flatter myself in saying that we've answered all of the questions, but just that we've had a very long day. So um, thank you all. Thank you to all the members of the committee. Thank you to the staff who've really put this all together for us. We'll see you all tomorrow. Have a very good evening and thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks everyone.